На, получи! Прикрой, завалим его! As a reward for successfully completing his investigation, Diktyrev was offered a promotion to colonel and the position of mission coordinator. He declined the opportunity to work at the HQ and submitted a personal request to be sent to the zone as the USS permanent observer. The information about the development of psi devices obtained by Diktyrev alerted USS commanders. All the information gathered on ex-designated laboratories was removed from military archives and filed as top secret. All personnel working in the zone were ordered to prevent the disclosure of information about the laboratories at any cost. Several experimental samples were made on the basis of technical documents for item 62. Following a set of test trials, it was decided not to go ahead with large-scale deployment of the weapon due to the high cost of ammunition. Nonetheless, it would be reasonable to assume that further development of the Gauss rifle is ongoing. Sultan and his gang left the Skadask to do their shady business elsewhere after their attempts to capture the ship failed. The ensuing feeling of relative safety among stalkers led to a massive increase in the number of artifacts sold to Beard, causing his business to boom, while the formerly quiet Skadavsk bar became as popular as the famous 100 Rads bar, despite being almost in the center of the zone. Following the destruction of the Bloodsucker Lair, it's unlikely that anything could significantly change the state of affairs on the Skadavsk. The old ship became a temporary center of stability in the ever-changing world that is the Zone. A fragile balance was reached between Freedom and Duty Squads at Yanov Station. Tired of the endless struggle, fighters of both factions started leaving their squads and joining the Free Stalkers. The scientific expedition, organized by professors Herman and Ozersky, was a success. The data they collected facilitated the development of groundbreaking medicine and technology, which prompted the Ministry of Education to allocate additional funding for researching the zone. Gary's stories about the Army's struggle against the dangers of Pripyat encouraged stalkers to explore the ghost town. Despite the constant monolith attacks, stalkers managed to secure the former army camp, which they used as a base to launch raids deep into the city, making slow but steady progress. The legend of the Oasis stopped being a legend. The identity of those who managed to find a way to the secret anomaly became an increasingly regular topic of conversation among stalkers. Despite this, the number of adventurers trying to find it remained high, something the bandits were quick to take advantage of, with constant offers to lead stalkers to the oasis, which usually ended in muggings at a safe distance from stalker camps. Organized mercenary squads continue to be active in the zone. Their interest in the secret laboratories is becoming increasingly difficult for USS operatives to ignore. Attempts to establish the identity of the client who hired the mercenaries proved unsuccessful. The area around Yanov Station continues to attract growing numbers of stalkers, 
the lack of dangerous mutants and abundance of anomalous areas have led to the area being referred to as a treasure trove with increasing regularity. Zulu returned to Dudi's main base at the Rostock plant. Nobody knows what he discussed with the leader of Dudi, General Veronin, but several days later he was spotted at the head of a large squad on its way to the center of the zone. Vano headed off to the freedom-controlled military warehouses, where his cheerful personality and optimism quickly earned him the popularity they merited. Ultimately, he took charge of a small group of researchers involved in investigating anomalous areas. A new group appeared in the zone. They are well trained, but their objectives are not known. Rumors say they used to be monolith fighters. Their leader is known as Strider. Senior Lieutenant Sokolov continued to take part in flying missions over the zone. During one such recon flight over Lamansk, his aircraft was shot down by mercenaries. Two weeks later, he was picked up by a patrol near the cordon. Within a month of his rescue, Sokolov had left the Air Force, joining a civil airline instead. Owl established contacts with clients outside the zone. He trades in information, and if rumors are true, there are regular reports sent directly to the USS. A group of stalkers was forced to seek shelter on Noah's old barge during a particularly powerful emission. When the barge was attacked by a horde of snorks afterwards, stalkers were forced to concede that the barge was as good a defense against mutants as anything they'd seen. Even more astonishing was a litter of pseudo-dog puppies that Noah himself led into battle against the snorks. Having found out about his friend's fates, Carden gave up dreams of a stalker career. Having overcome his alcoholism, he moved to Yanov, where he partnered up with Nitro to set up a full-service repair shop. Both technicians gladly devote all their spare time to building a vehicle that could operate in the zone. Strelok passed on the information he obtained on his trip to the Chernobyl NPP to the USS commanders. This prompted the government to create a scientific institute for research of the Chernobyl anomalous area. Strelok took up the position of chief scientific consultant to the institute. When Colonel Kowalski, commander of the Stingray Group, returned from the zone, he was forced to explain the reasons for the failure of Operation Fairway. Following a dragged-out investigation and the Brass's failed attempt to make him the fall guy, the colonel was finally given an honorable discharge.